What's up guys and welcome to Celtics Direct. If you're new here, make sure to subscribe. You'll be helping us out and also be kept updated on all of the latest Celtics content. And also check out our latest Celtics inspired fan merchandise all on our website. That being said, let's get right into the video. And welcome to another episode of All About 18 Podcast. I'm Matt Poirier. And I'm Trevor Perinello. And we have a very special guest today from WEI. Rich Keefe is with us. How are you doing, Rich? Good. You? Good, I'm, good. Thank you for I'm joining good. us. And we had a we had a few questions to get to know your guests. We like to do uh, here on All About 18. Um, so I, I was listening to your radio show the other day on Dale and Holly with Keith. That's right. Don't um, forget it. From 2 to 6. <laughs> 2 to 6, 93.7 on the dial. And uh, I know you guys were kind of going back and forth debating, uh, you know, a possible new name for the show. Yes. It is kind of just, you, you seem like an add-on, as you said. I so do. If, if you had to come up with a name, what would it just be like, Keith and the boys? Or what would it be? Yeah, it could be like the Rich Keith Project featuring Dale and Holly or, or you know, something along <laughs> those lines. Yeah, I reverse mean, it. I, honestly, I don't even mind it that much. My, my, my name is in the show, so I can't really complain too much. I know Holly. Holly's really pushing for me. I think he just wants me to get into a fight with Dale about it. But frankly, I, I, I think I could do a lot worse. So I will I will take with for the time being, and then we'll, we'll see what happens from there. It's better than without. Great point. Yeah, it could just be Dale and Holly, and a, a third guy talks randomly. Like, that would that'd be not good. Yeah, I remember when... Uh, the show, you're not just Adam. <laughs> Right. When when Thornton was on the show, it used to just be Dale and Holly, and then they wouldn't really mention Thornton, and then it took like a few months for him to get added on to the name. Yeah, then you're like, who's this other guy talking? And you're like, well, we don't know. It's just Dale and Holly. <laughs> who's this old guy who loves Tom Brady? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and then I saw you had your own podcast uh, called The Dork Podcast. Yes. Uh, so what's that all about? So that is, uh, it's called Hashtag Dork, or The Dork Podcast. Call it whatever you want. It's uh, TV, movies, video games, comic books, all that kind of dork stuff you know we go and see guardians of the galaxy wonder woman you name it and then we talk about it so it's once a week it's on itunes it's on the eei website and all that stuff it's just other crap besides sports that i really like nice awesome and yeah it's great to have another passion and uh i haven't seen wonder woman but i did hear that it was good and i saw batman and superman and that was terrible it was not good no we also we did an episode on that so you take the good with the bad and we just crapped all over that like we would do any kind of sporting event basically so yeah, that's kind of what the podcast is. We've had some fun with it. We've had some good debates about, you know, sports video games and, and all that crap. So it's, it's been good. Nice, nice. And I, I had to ask because I saw that your profile picture was like a, a Muppet, if I'm correct. It's Guy Smiley. Yeah. It's America's favorite game show host. Okay. And uh, that's what I figured, but I yeah. didn't know uh, kind of what you had going on there, what you were trying to go for. I thought he was good. So he's an old Sesame Street character, which I don't even know if that show is still on or not. I'm sure it is because it's a it's classic. Comedy. But he was, uh, yeah, he was dubbed as America's favorite game show host. His name is Guy Smiley. He's always in a good mood. He's got a microphone. I thought it was really the the perfect picture. And, and a I guy sounds just like you. And he sounds a lot like me. He's got a he's got a good radio voice. Actually, he has a better voice than I do. And uh, yeah, I think that's a it's a good picture, a good representation of me. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. And then to go on your, not to search through your whole Twitter sphere, but. Hey, get uh, in there. Dive in. I noticed, you know, at Keith21, I'm like, what is, uh, obviously, Keith is self explanatory, but what is 21? So there was no, uh, Keith was taken. I don't know who that bastard was that stole at <laughs> Keith when I first signed up, but 21 is simply my high school basketball number. So it's just, ah, just ah. that's all it is. I like <laughs> it. Starting varsity, stud center? Uh, not Keith a center. center. No, I'm 5'11, nope. so I was a guard. I don't think you're a center. <laughs> no, it did not play center. Center, played guard, uh, yes, varsity, and uh, I was I was fine. I was an, I was an okay player. What uh, what made you pick twenty one for the number when you were in high school? That's a good question. I think it was a number I was probably just given in like third or fourth grade, and then I just stuck with it. And like every yeah. year, that was I was just twenty one in basketball because like Marcus Camby, I remember at UMass was twenty one. Uh, yeah. Like that was a good one, but like I don't even think it was necessarily I I picked it. I think I got it, and then I just that I embraced it as as my number. Yeah, Sweet. I was. I was the classic kid who would pick 23 and wasn't nearly good enough to wear 23. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no business being 23. No. No, no, no one. I don't think anyone has. But, True. Uh, certainly a number that to live up to. Um, so let's get down right to it. Um, so I got some Celtics questions, as we said. Got some Twitter questions from our followers. Really responsive. Really great. Really appreciative. Um, so I had some questions. I'll start with the obvious. Um, your overall thoughts on Markel Fultz. And it seems the biggest concern is that he only had nine wins. Uh, I, you know, his team kind of sucked. But is that a concern when you're looking at a draft pick? I think it needs to be at least mentioned because if these guys in college are supposed to be so good you don't have to go to the final four but how you can't 
get to the tournament or even have a winning record. You know, like Ben Simmons a couple of years ago, I remember saying the same thing. You can't get to the tournament. It doesn't mean he won't be a great player, but I, I do think it needs to be at least worth mentioned. The other the other concern with Fultz is, you know, he missed some games due to injury. So you have a guy who was hurt a little bit as a freshman and he was on a really bad team. But with all that said, he does seem like the, the slam dunk number one pick, you know, and this is a guy, I don't know how much you guys got a chance to see him, but I remember I was, all, I was all excited. Washington UCLA was a, I think it was a Wednesday night ESPN game at like nine. And I was like, yeah, perfect. Was. I was like, Lonzo Ball, Markel Fultz, I'm in. And then Fultz was out with an injury. And it was, so he didn't get a chance to see him. Like Lonzo Ball, I feel like I saw play maybe 10 times. Like I saw him like a lot, I feel like this year. Whereas Fultz, I've been one of these guys that's just watching his YouTube highlights right now. And let's be honest, you, me, we, we all look good in YouTube highlights. So hard to tell, but the skill set clearly is, is there. And he seems also like the best fit for the team. Yeah, even the old 21 would look good on YouTube. I think uh, oh, it, it would, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess to go off ball, I mean, is there any way, any chance that the Celtics would pass on Fultz to go for ball? I don't I don't think so. And I, I think that they need another scorer. And not that Fultz will necessarily be that scorer in year one, but I think he projects to at least be a scorer in the NBA. Whereas Lonzo Ball might be fine, might be a guy who scores in the teens, but he's more of a pass first guy and that's his main skill set. And I just think what they need, a guy that can just take the ball and score on his own, create his own stuff. I think that's much more faults. And there were all the different rumors out there too, that he w- he wasn't going to work out with anybody else. And then he was going to work out with the Kings. And then maybe that wasn't going to be the case. So, and then Josh Jackson recently said that he's not going to work out for the Celtics. So I wonder if word is already out there that, nope, they got their guy and it's, it's going to be Fultz. Yeah. yeah. It's, it seems the case for sure. Yeah. Fultz is like the prototypical NBA guard of the future where you need someone who can score and create for himself while also having like a great passing ability and ability to rebound and make plays on defense. So I think he's definitely fits the mold of what the Celtics want. Yeah. I mean, you see what James Harden and Russell Westbrook and like just how dominant those guys were and how they can affect the game everywhere. Now, maybe they're not great defensive players, but they can make players better, like their teammates better by passing and they can also contribute to, to rebounding, which is a huge issue for the Celtics. So somebody like that who's a better all-around player, I think, makes a ton of sense. Yeah. And, uh, going off kind of this was our theme of the Twitter questions. I mean, you'll touch on different topics, but um, from Sean71, he asked, uh, build for the future or when now? I know it's kind of broad, but I think that's a big question when it comes to the Celtics. Yeah, and I think it's kind of a uh, – like because right now they're doing both. And it's kind of a, a weird thing where they make the conference finals, although I don't think anybody really gave them a great shot in the against the Cavs, but they're the second best team in the East, and yet they have the number three pick in the draft as a rookie. They have the number one pick coming up, and they'll probably have another top five pick going forward. So they are kind of have a foot in both worlds. And I honestly, I think playing towards the future is really the way to go. Like, unless you're going to get a top five or top 10 guy, an already established player, and that's what you're going to be able to trade away the young guys for, you probably should just develop Brown, Fultz, and whoever else you get and hope by the time that they're really good, the Cavs and LeBron are on their way down. That's probably the best bet. Yeah, Yeah, I I completely agree because, like, we have no chance at competing with the Warriors and the Cavs, as we just saw. Like, if you just watch that final series and think that we're even close to the Warriors, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, people keep trying to fit, like, Fultz and Jalen, like, behind guys like Hayward and Isaiah, but if you keep not playing them at their natural position and keep playing them off the bench, then they're not going to develop as fast as they would otherwise. Yeah, no, it's true. And I do think that, you know, Fultz can play with Isaiah, you know, as, as a bigger guard and they can, they can take turns on, you know, who's bringing the ball up the court, who's starting the offense, you know, give Isaiah a break from that and let him shoot a little bit more. And then and vice versa. I think they can do that. Jalen Brown's going to be intriguing because as great as Brad Stevens has been as a coach, I do wonder if this year, could he have used him more? Like, could he have played more during the regular season? And then he actually could have been more of a factor for you in the playoffs. That might be my one knock against him is sort of the development of Brown in year one. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I, I was kind of mad when he would not play and Jarebko would get minutes over him. Right. <laughs> and G- Gerald, <laughs> Gerald Green starting and you're like, what, yeah. what are we doing? <laughs> Two of those guys I would imagine are goodbye. Yeah, I would I would think so. And then, you know, other guys are going to be gone too. Like, you know, Kelly Olenek will be gone. Um, Amir Johnson, obviously we're talking about big guys there. They're going to be gone. They're probably going to have to trade either Rozier or Smart. And I, I always defend Smart. I happen to like Smart, but I know he has, a, he has his flaws 
But if they draft Fultz, they're going to clearly have to get rid of somebody back there. Yeah, yeah. That, that actually brings up uh, another Twitter question, believe it or not. Uh, Will Carlson, 99, literally just kind of asked just like that. With Fultz, what does that mean for the future of Smart and Rogier? I mean, I think Smart is – I'm personally not a big Smart fan. I know he's a great defender. I just don't think he has that, like, high, high ceiling of maybe an all-star, but that's maybe. And Rogier, I actually like better. Oh, do you – see, I like Smart more, and – they 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 are kind of similar in a sense. I just always thought Smart was more explosive. Like and he had he had a, he had a better chance to be good offensive. Like we saw him, he had one good playoff game this year. He had one really good playoff game last year. And you see that and you think, well, this guy could maybe turn into a really good player, maybe like a fringe All Star, like you said. But then he has a bunch of games where he goes out there, he shoots you know three of twelve, and he, and he's just clanging threes. And you're like, this guy is never gonna figure it out offensively. So it might come down to as simple as who could you get more for like if there's a team that really likes smart or for really likes rosier probably gonna have to part with one of them me per- i personally would part with rosier but honestly maybe even both of them could go you know if you're talking about thomas bradley fultz and who knows what the rest of their young team is going to look like maybe they, they they find a way to deal both yeah how about uh bradley to go off that yeah, yeah see bradley it's funny because when he signed his last contract i was like oh that's a ton of money for him and then as it went on, it ended up being a real value deal. So he's really solidified himself as a better offensive player than certainly Marcus Smart is. Now, I know he's older than Smart. He's been in the league longer, but he is a better option. He's a better shooter, and he's a better defender. Like, as good of a defender as Smart is, Bradley's a better defensive player, especially on, you know, point guards and things like that, which Isaiah can't guard. So I think Bradley, unless he wants, like, an insane amount of money that they won't want to give him, like, maybe, maybe and we saw what Evan Turner just got. So maybe Avery Bradley, when when he becomes a free agent, somebody will offer him a max. I don't think he's worth that. Um, so if he'll take less, again, less than the max, I think he ends up staying with the Celtics. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Trevor, I know you have your thoughts on Avery Bradley when it comes to, I mean, I would trade him in a second just because he is, uh, you know, and I say in a second, but I mean, just because he's a free agent coming up this year and, you know, the guards that you're getting, you're getting faults and you already have Rogier and Smart. So I would trade him, but uh, I know you want to sign him long term. I'm, I'm out on him long term. Yeah, Bradley. I mean, I, I think Bradley is easily like a top five perimeter defender in the league. And I kind of feel similar about Smart, whereas he's one of the most def- versatile defenders in the league, guarding positions one through five. So to me, I would rather, honestly, I'd rather trade Isaiah and keep those two to be a good defensive team alongside Fultz. And you'd still have decent scoring. And when you add the improved overall team defense, when you cancel out Isaiah, then I think you're still a competitive playoff team in the East while developing your young guys and being a good defensive team for a while. Well, what's funny is in the series against the Cavs, Isaiah Thomas goes down. And so now you're thinking you have a really great defensive backcourt and Bradley and smart and Kyrie Irving goes out there and scores a zillion points. So yeah, that whole, I mean, that whole part of it is, is kind of overrated, you know, because smart and Bradley, they're better defensively. And then you have guys like Curry and Irving and wall and Harden who don't play defense, but are just significantly better players and more important. So you can't have zero defense, but being good defensively in the NBA today, isn't really the most important thing. Yeah. And I, I thought it was crazy when people, you know, of course the warriors, everyone's like, Oh my God, they're so great. And obviously they are. And they say, oh, well, the reason they're great is because Durant's defense, he's really improved. And I'm like, give me a freaking break. Are you kidding me? You have Curry, play. Well, that Drake. does have a lot to do with it. It's like how many, sco- you know, I mean, there's so many scoring options. Hell, even Zaza Batulia. I mean, all of a sudden he becomes a threat just because there's so much space. Yeah, I mean, they were ridiculous. And, like, they, they are good defensively. And sometimes you look at the scores and you just assume that they're not. But that's just the pace that they play. And Clay Thompson, I think, has really improved. He was not really known for his defense before, but now you see him. He's the guy that has to guard, you know, Kyrie Irving and try to do the best on him. And then, you know, Curry can't play defense. So you just put Curry on somebody else. And Dur- Draymond Green is like an all NBA defensive type player. So, yeah, they're they're sneaky good defensively. I know they gave up what was like 49 points in a quarter against the Cavs, but but they are pretty good defensively. They're known for their offense and they should be. Like that's definitely what they're what they're the best at. But they're they're really I mean, they're they're a complete team that just looks unstoppable right now. Yeah, they're like yeah, the and- most versatile defensive team in the league. And that's yeah. kind of it's it's more about versatility in the NBA when it comes to defense defense now rather than just like solid lockdown defense you need guys who are able to close out on all positions so yeah like Andre Iguodala comes off the bench and they go with that he comes in for Pachulia and they go with that the lineup of death or whatever the hell they call it and it's yeah. it's just I don't know how you match up against it <laughs> all the lineups are death that's the problem true yeah and speak about Iguodala just uh would you 
target if you're the Celtics? Is that someone you target? I know he's not like young, but you know he's got experience. Obviously, he can play defense. Is he that good, or is it just the team that he's on? See, I think he's solid. Like we saw him all those years when he was on the 76ers, and he, he was kind of he wasn't cast right. Like he was their best player, and you're like, all right, well, he can only go so far with him as their best player. Then he was he was on one of the Olympic teams, and you saw, all right, when he's when he's sort of a supporting character, you can see how good he is. So I think unless they really lowball him and they can't afford him, I think he just ends up back there. Like I think you know they've been to three straight finals, they've won two of them. He was a finals MVP at this stage. Like if he was five years younger, maybe he would jump onto a team for whatever the money is. But I, I bet he stays there. And if I'm the Celtics, I think that's fine. Like, I think, again, we talk about Jalen Brown. I really want to develop him as much as possible next year, and that would be a guy that would take minutes away from him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like Jalen Brown. Um, I know Trevor would like to start him next year. I'm not – I know he's got the body and the athleticism, but I'm not ready to say here's a starting position. I don't. I didn't see enough to say here you go. Well, if they have Gordon Hayward, like, and that's another whole thing, but if they – if they get him, then I don't think you start Jalen Brown. But if they don't, I really – I mean, he should be – he was the third pick in the draft. Like, he should be better than Jay Crowder. Like, I would, I yeah, would hope that he – Yeah, I'm with you. I, I hope he, he should. And if, if not, he, you're, you're talking about – I mean, maybe – I mean, year two might be a little early, but at least at some point in year two, you got you got to pass over a guy like that. Yeah, I mean, Jay Crowder, I mean, I don't like him at all, to be honest. I can't <laughs> – it drives me nuts when he gets into the corner and he tries to get out of it, and it's an automatic turnover. I know he shot better from the three this year, and some have said, well, if you take Hayward's numbers and you take Crowder's numbers, they're actually fairly close. But you watch Hayward. I mean, he's you know he creates his own shot. He's just a totally different player. Could separate the floor a little bit more. I mean, Jay Crowder to me, you would trade um, if you can, if you can get a good. good oh yeah, in a second, in a second, I would tra- trade Crowder. And the other thing with Hayward is he averaged whatever it was, 21, 22 points, and the Jazz play at like a snail's pace. So yeah. if you put him on any like real team, like and I, I mean the Jazz were good, but you know what I'm saying, like a team that actually goes up and down the floor, yeah. he would average a lot more than that. And so even if, if some of his you know shooting numbers or rebounding numbers or whatever are similar to Crowder, I mean he'd blow that out of the wall. Here. Yeah, and um, you know, is Hayward worth it? I know um, you know, some have debated and Trevor is certainly one of these people uh, you know, that says, Well, Hayward, you know, would like Hayward, but the way the Celtics are compared to the Cavs and the Warriors, is he really worth a max contract just based on where the Celtics are, not entirely based on him, but where the Celtics are. Yeah, and that's a tough one. And I think the fact that you don't have to give up anything for him, like it's not like you're trading and then having a, a big you know, a big signing. I think he is like, I think he's gotten better every year. He's been in the league, you know, this time last year, I probably would have said, nah, I'm good, but he was so much better this year. He took a step up even in the playoffs. He was better. And he, and he fits what they need. Like if you just swapped him in for Crowder, you're talking about a, like a much better score. Now you have two 20 point scores on your team. And then that way Horford and Bradley, you're not relying on any offense from them. Like if whatever they chip in is great, but now you have two guys that are probably going to average 50 or more points together between the two of them and he's still in his prime. So yeah, I would, I would roll the dice. Yeah, I'd roll the dice on, on Hayward. I'd give him a max deal. Yeah. My thing with Hayward is more that he's definitely worth a max deal by like any team, but my thing with Hayward is more that it somewhat affects the long-term plan. It doesn't like completely ruin it, which is why I'm indifferent. I wouldn't be too mad if we signed him, but if you do sign him, then that means he has like what a four year deal through 2022. So then once it's 2021 and your young rookies that you have like Jalen Fultz and the Nets pick, once they're coming into their own and they're like on the verge of signing that second contract, you wouldn't have cap space at that point to then sign a big free agent who could actually put you over the top at that time. And instead you'd have Hayward on your books. Yeah, but you would also, you'd be getting rid of Horford, right? Because Horford has three years left. And so that'd be $30 million off. And then, it, I mean, it really depends on what they do with Isaiah Thomas. And I think, you know, while for most of the time that Hayward is under contract, Brown, Fultz, and the next Nets pick would all be on their rookie deals or at least right up to it. So I think, I think you'd be able to to manage it. Plus, it seems like the cap is going up every single year. So, like I said before, Avery Bradley, when they originally signed him, you're like, oh, that's kind of a bad deal. But then it ended up being a great deal. And so, I think with with Hayward, it's not like they can sign him to a seven or eight year deal. Like I think if they sign him yeah. to the, you know whatever they're allowed to do as a as a team that he wasn't with, they sign him, and I, I think they'd be okay. And you know he improves the team. So now, if anything does happen to Cleveland, now all of a sudden you're the you're the next team that's right there ready to go. Yeah, that's, yeah, a that's good point. my thought. I mean, you can't you can't build a team and say, no, we're just going to sit back for four or five years 
I know it sounds good in theory to build the young guys and, you know, build them up and go from there, but you can't just sit back four or five years. You got to be ready to pounce. You know, LeBron goes down or, I mean, you know, I don't know if this happened, but LeBron goes to LA, whatever. I mean, there's so many things that could happen. It's crazy to just say, no, we're going to wait until everyone develops and then we'll see where we are. Because I think that's a big mistake because other teams like the Bucks, the Heat, all those teams are going to be better than they are now, I would imagine. Yeah, I guess I never really thought about the Horford, like, expiring contract thing. Like if if he does like not accept his player option, then you would have space to probably still sign a max guy. So I, I didn't realize that. That's a good point. And then you look at what like, the Seventy Sixers have done, and when they started doing this whole process thing, I thought, oh, that's not that's not a bad idea. But you're going to be terrible for a number of years, and then you, you need to hope to hit on all the picks and retain all your players. And it's just that clearly not going to work like you went like three years ago maybe four years ago you said you know what the Sixers might be in a better position than the Celtics but then you see how quickly that is that has changed so the old oh we're just going to punt until LeBron's retires like that that's also not going to work and that's ter- it's a terrible message to your fan base too yeah, yeah and now I, they're in like a it. really risky scenario yo big time yeah I, I hate that mentality to just say oh no we'll wait maybe KD leaves in two years maybe you know you can't do that and I know it seems like well why bother you're not going to win with the Cavs and you're certainly not going to win the Warriors but you can't you can't do that you can't punt four or five years it's not how it rolls right but they're also not you know trading like it's one thing if they took all the Nets picks and traded it for like Jimmy Butler or like something right. nuts like that like that that's insane like you don't need to go all in and try to beat LeBron but you also don't need to just lay down and let him win for the next five years right and Ainge we know Ainge won't do that right. either way right Either way, whether it's over aggressive or just no, sit back and do nothing. Um, you mentioned Thomas. I wanted to sign him long term. I still do. I, I like him, but you know, between his hip, you know, obviously his height on defense is an issue. Um, he can score like heck, but I think the best scenario at this point would just be let him kind of ride it out this year, see how he is with presumably faults, and then kind of try to get him on a team friendly deal. If, if someone's going to take a team friendly deal, it's going to be Thomas. I have a feeling. Yeah, I think the good news is, you know, not for him but for the Celtics is that he has one year left so you can see how he responds from injury you know two years ago he played every single game he didn't miss a single game this year he missed a few regular season games then obviously his season got cut short in the playoffs but if he comes back and has a really good year then yeah you definitely want him because the argument for me when people are like ah like you can't win with Thomas it's like all right we'll make a list of the people you can win with and let me know how available they are like how are, how are you going to get any of those guys and so Thomas, you already have, and he fits in great. And he proved this year in the playoffs, he can be terrific. Uh, again, ha- had a couple bad games and got hurt, but he also had some, he had a 53 point game in the playoffs. So he's definitely a guy I would want. If he takes less money, great. But even if he doesn't, I think he might just have to, you might have to bring up the Brinks trucks, like he says, and, and pay him. Yeah, they were to trade Thomas. I really don't think he would have that great value just because if you're looking at it, you know, work a bias, we watch him every night and we know what he is. But if you're looking at another team perspective on this, say, well, it's a 5'9 guard. Yes, I know he can score a lot. And now he's coming off this hip thing. That could involve surgery. Maybe not, but still. And now he's, and he's a free agent at the end of the year. I'd be like, mid round first, maybe. Like, yeah, he's a tough, it'd you know. be a weird guy to trade. Plus, like, what team would he go to? Like, we, we we had the same conversation with Rondo a few years ago. It's you look around and like everybody has a good point guard. Like like it, it's a there's a sliding scale there, but that's not a position of need for a lot of people. And who would want to pay him that kind of money if you weren't a playoff team and do you already have a guy? So he, he fits in well with the Celtics. So I think that's just what you're gonna do. Yeah, for sure. And um, I know you mentioned that you wouldn't trade. You know, obviously we're not gonna trade the, all the picks for Butler. Um, but how about? When it comes to, you know, George is obviously a big conversation. Like uh, Galen Carr 07 had asked, would you trade the pick for Anthony Davis or Clay Thompson for this year's pick? The number, the number one overall pick, I would trade yeah. for Anthony Davis. Yeah, absolutely I would. I don't think they would, but I would. Clay Thompson, I, I would act. Ooh, that's actually a good. One. I never even I never even considered that for the number one overall pick. I think that's really close though. I guess I think I would do it. I might because he would also be a perfect fit here too. He he would be. You know what? Yeah, I would. I would, I would yeah. for Clay Thompson. Yeah. Oh, the shooter, and as you said, he's developing defensively. Yeah. Um, I would, I would, I would do that. Do it. Yep. I definitely lean towards no, just because I don't think go over the edge of the Cavs or the Warriors. I mean, I don't know, maybe the Warriors since you're taking him away, but I just think I'd rather take Fultz and be set up for a longer term future. Than- with yeah, I mean, it's tough to trade the number one pick. It, it doesn't happen often for a reason, and he could develop into a great player. But my, my other thing is, anytime you have a lottery pick, even if it's number one, you're like, all right, best case scenario for some of those guys 
is that they turn into a Paul George or a Clay Thompson or Anthony Davis or whatever. So you might as well do it as long as they're in their prime. I think Clay Thompson's 27. So, I mean, Markel Fultz just turned 19. So, like, you're talking about a big difference there. So if I was pressed on it, I'd probably do it. But um, I understand those that wouldn't. Yeah, I'm yeah. definitely – I'm just really high on Fultz because I watched – I did watch way too much with him at Washington. and very disappointing because I had to watch all that <laughs> bad basketball. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just really high on him. And I think he could be a future maybe top 10 player. And that's what you need in this NBA. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that and you look at the last uh, what three or four point guards that got drafted one overall with, you know, John Wall, Kyrie Irving, Derek Rose. I mean, they're all great. Like they've, they've hit on those guys. So hopefully Fultz is, is another one of those. Yeah. Yeah. And um, for the off season, who do you have this coming from? Um, let's see. Holmes underscore nine underscore seventy seven. People really need to just get basic Twitter. It's like Keith twenty one. <laughs> Keith twenty one is the way to go. It's easy. But uh, who do the C's have the best chance of getting? Uh, Hayward, Blake, or Paul George? I think definitely Gordon Hayward. I mean, and I don't think that's a slam dunk or by any means, but I think that that is the most likely. You know, obviously there's the Brad Stevens connection, but it'd be a good fit. It's on a good team for him, and. He's a free agent, whereas Paul George, you'd have to trade for, and then you'd have to hope that he signs an extension. So I don't think Paul George is likely. And Blake Griffin, I'd be intrigued by, but I'd be more intrigued if they didn't have Horford. Like, I don't know about Horford Griffin together. Like, I think it could work, but I don't think it'd be the best. Plus, does he really want to go from LA to Boston? So I think the most likely would definitely be just, you know, straight up signing Gordon Hayward. Yeah, I mean, my biggest concern, I actually like Blake Griffin a lot. My biggest yeah. concern is the injuries. I mean, it's every year. All the time. It's, it's something, and it's not going to stop. It's just, you know, once you're hurt one time, I feel like you get hurt five times. Yeah, and he also, like, his rebounding has gone down, like, just about every year. And he's I like him a lot, too. Like, a few years ago, he was one of the best players in the league. And then he just keeps fighting these different injuries, and the Clippers are always a disappointment, so the season always ends poorly for them. This time, he was, he was hurt, too. Um, but... Yeah, I, I don't think it, he's very likely to come here. And uh, another trade scenario coming through the Twitter. You know, a lot of people like the trade scenarios. It's and the best. Yeah. Would you do this and that? But it's it's fun. Um, so this coming, I'll try to pronounce this. A underscore color Rossi, 14. Apologize if I'm saying that wrong. But uh, had an interesting take. Uh, would you trade next year's Nets pick for a top five for this year? I think I would. Just because you do not know what the hell next year's Nets pick is going to be. It's true. You don't. But I wonder if you could use that as a trade for another player. Although, I guess you could do the same for your, for, for the fifth. Um, it's a good question. I mean, that, for Danny Ainge, he'd probably look at it. You know, how much does he like Josh Jackson? Or how much does he like, you know, fill in the next player? Because you wouldn't want to draft two of the guards, I wouldn't think. You know, it's very guard heavy. I don't think you'd want two of those guys. I think I'd rather have the flexibility of the two drafts. And maybe you get the one pick again. Maybe you get the five pick, whatever it is. But I think I would rather that flexibility. So I, I would say no. Yeah, if you get if you keep the pick for next year, next year's draft class is even more stacked at the top than this one is. because. This year, it's just Fultz, and then the other three, they're good, but they're not as superstar potential. Next year, you have guys like Luka Dongic and Michael Porter Jr. and Muhammad Bamba. Who, like, would and they're have all bigs, the all- too, like, yeah. which is what they need. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. They would have the all-time, like, highest wingspan for Bamba. So, exactly. if you could get a big big with next year's pick, then I don't think the Nets are going to get any better while teams at the bottom will get better with their draft picks from this year. I'm with you. Yeah, so I would do it. Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, I don't know. I just think you're always, especially the Celtics luck, I know they got locked out this year i just always feel they're gonna get screwed over in the lottery and in that case if you if you like a player and you hone in on them or as you said you know take this pick this extra pick that you would get and flip it for someone else you know but you still can get bolts that way you know that's i think yeah. is another another direction you could go um overall do you think there are any like true untouchables on this team because i do not include no. bolts no 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 there's there's not a single untouchable. Like, as good as Isaiah Thomas is, like, he was all NBA second team this year, which is great. And they have some other players that I that I like, but man, there's definitely, like, they don't have a top 10 guy. They don't probably, they don't have a top 15 guy. Thomas, I should probably do the list someday. I, I always reference the top 10, top 20 players, but I don't know. I haven't actually made a list. That would probably make a lot of sense. But it's he's the probably, invisible least list I, of Keith. 
Yeah, like I well, I probably have like twenty guys in the top ten and whatever else. But he's so he's he's a great player. But no, there are so many guys better that you would you would trade for if they were available. So they don't have anybody untouchable. And I think Danny Ainge knows as much too. I think he's even said as much. And so I think that's a good sign for Celtics fans that he's always looking to improve his team and he's not getting too you know married to any of the players that are currently on the team. Yeah, would it, that would that include faults? Because I don't think it would. I mean, you got you got to explore all the options. No, I think he I think he'd be open. To, to trading everybody like he might really like Fultz but there's always going to be a better offer out there and like that's the beauty of the NBA or one of the beauties of the NBA I think is these big name players they do move it's not like guys are just locked in like oh well, he's going to be on that team forever it's like no they move and so you might be surprised at who becomes available and who gets traded away so they always got to be ready for that and if something great like Anthony Davis like the tech uh, like the tweeter mentioned if he all of a sudden becomes available then yeah Fultz is going to be on the first plane to New Orleans <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would do it. I know Trevor. Trevor, now would you trade him for the Anthony Davis? Oh, Come on. For, sure, for sure. But that's I just, okay. I just don't think that's realistic. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> but, no. but just no. playing the game, then yeah, you would. Yeah, I mean, I know, yeah. I know you like faults, but I mean, it becomes a does obviously become a player that you could get like Anthony Davis that you also it, open it's up still your mind to. it's still a little bit of a risk with Anthony Davis, I think as well. Don't get me wrong, he's awesome and like faults. His potential still probably isn't even close to Anthony Davis, but. He does have those weird injury problems with his feet and his legs as a big man, which is somewhat of a concern, but I would obviously still do it. Yeah, I mean, again, like he's only made the playoffs once, so he's not like a perfect player, but uh, he's, I guess he's pretty close. And so you, you, there, he, he does have his flaws, but you, you take a chance. Now, what, but yeah. I mean, he's been on a crap team, you know? I mean, when as New Orleans has been on a legitimate team since he's been there, they haven't. But, um, you know, that goes True. back to me, like to the Fultz thing, like how much can you blame the player? You know, what can he do? He is only a big, it's, I know he can shoot, but, you know, he has sh- crap around him. He yeah, really no, does. he does. And that's yeah. why I wonder what's going to happen. You know, they're probably going to play out the half season with Davis and Cousins. And then if they're still not a playoff team, I mean, maybe they trade one or both or who knows. They might have to blow it up. I don't know. Maybe Davis starts to get pissed and he wants to go. Like he gets disgruntled like most guys do when they're the only good player. So, that, I mean, that'll be an interesting guy to keep an eye on. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how New Orleans doesn't have any success with – you know, a lot of people talked about them. Oh, they'll make the playoffs now. Now that they have cousins, and I think they felt bet they got worse. It almost feel, felt like I don't understand how that's possible. It was weird. like they played. I think they were the same, or maybe they were a game better with him. And the Kings were like a game worse without cousins. It was very strange. I thought that as soon as that trade happened, I thought New Orleans was gonna make the playoffs, but I was definitely wrong. <laughs> yeah, and um, one of our questions here from Brenny underscore st. Uh, you know, when it comes to trading for a star or a big man, um, which player do you believe makes the most sense? For this, I would think Crowder, as we had talked about. Um, but is it Smart, Rogier? What player would make the most sense? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, if you think that they're going to be able to just sign Hayward, I think trading Crowder makes a lot of sense. Trading one of those guards makes the most sense because, I mean, you might be able to get more for Bradley. Like if, if another team called, like what would the sort of the order be? Like if, if, if you're not going to trade Thomas and Horford, not that they're untradeable, but only because you're building around those guys, they're going to be your main players. Then you might get the most for Bradley, but I probably wouldn't want to give up, give him up. Um, so yeah, smart Rozier Crowder. Those, those are probably be the guys to go. Yeah. I mean, I would trade Bradley because like I say, he's a free agent at the end of this year. Yeah. I'm not all for the biggest thing for Bradley is the injuries. And if you're not available to play, how can you rely on them? And if you can get a true solid big man, a star is a little too strong, but a solid big man, right? I think you have to think about it. Yeah, I mean, I wonder. I mean, I guess it depends on who the big man is because you look at right, the it's team. Right, kind of broad. It is right, and you already have Horford, so it has to be somebody that can play with Horford. And you just look at like you know the Warriors, like their best lineup doesn't even really have a big man in it, and like the the Cavaliers, you know, they kind of struggle as great as Love can be at times. You know, Love and Thompson, they would often have to have one of those guys on the on the bench, you know, when they had their best lineups. So it's not the most important thing. I'm really actually intrigued by Yabuselli and Zusich. Like, I don't really know much about them except what, what I've read, but I'm, I'm intrigued that maybe one of them will develop into something good. Yeah, which would be nice. I mean, it's definitely a cheap way to go if nothing else. Exactly, yeah. 
Um, you know, I know there's some conversation of whether they're coming over this year. I would hope they would. Um, yeah. but that, that may affect the cap if they do, and that's the problem. But either way, you got to get someone because Amir Johnson is just didn't cut it this year. Amir didn't cut it, and Kelly Olynyk's going to sign somewhere else. So there's already two spots available, so they're going to have to fill that somehow. I would yeah. just like to see them trade Crowder for a big man that can rebound, especially if we sign Hayward. Yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be down with that for sure. Would you ever play Jalen? We've debated this, Trevor and I. I think I would in a in the right lineup, maybe not long term, but would you play Jalen at the four ever? Yeah, well, if he gets a little bit stronger, like I know he already came in with it, whatever. Oh, he's got a man's body and all this other stuff, but he still got pushed around at times by guys. Like you'd see him guard, you know, whether it was Carmelo or even LeBron a little bit. Like those guys who are, I guess, traditionally small forwards that also play the four, and clearly he can't match up with them yet and maybe he never will i mean that's that's a lot to ask for with those guys but i think eventually and ideally you probably would like you'd, you'd hope that he takes advantage of the of the quickness matchup there and i think you probably you know whether it's him and crowder or him and hayward or whatever that you probably will see that lineup yeah i mean i would like it uh you know see what it is because the way the nba is going as trevor mentioned versatility on defense, the most important, and uh, Jalen certainly has it if he can just improve a little bit, gain a little more muscle. Um, you mentioned Melo. I just have to ask because I would trade for Melo, believe it or not, I, just because I think he's a pure scorer. I know the reputation of him not being a team player, kind of a loser, but, I mean, he's a pure scorer, and we have seen what he can do. Any interest you think there on your end? Yeah. Oh, yeah, in my end, sure. I, I like Carmelo, and I, I think he gets kind of a, a bad rap. People just kind of pile on him like he's not that good because his teams haven't had a ton of success and you know, he deserves some of that criticism. I would, he's a guy though, at this stage of his career, I wouldn't give up much for him. Whereas three or four years ago, he would have been worth a ton. You would, you would probably would have had to have given up a lot, but just him on the team. Like, I think this came up on the radio show the other day. Somebody was like, if you could just swap out Crowder for Carmelo. And you know how Celtics fans are. Some of them are like, no yeah. way, I wouldn't do that. I'm like, what? I'm like, That's a nice freaking brainer. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, this guy's serious. He's going to, he's 20 points a game every season of his entire career. He's just going to, you trot him out there. And I would, I would definitely do that. Uh, but then what, you know, if you start getting into, would you give up this pick or this player? Like that's where you, you might kind of. And I think the biggest issue with Melo to trade wise, technically wise is to match the salary. And that's going to be really difficult for the Celtics. Yeah, no, that would be, I mean, they got like a Zeller still under contract, right? And that's like 8 million bucks or whatever. So, I mean, you could try to figure something out. And you're under well, the I think cap. That's non-guaranteed, right? Because I think there was, he's not a free agent, but it's non-guaranteed. So I think that, that might be your best contract to move when it comes to that. Yeah, yeah, but but I I usually try like if they want to get a deal done, they can get creative, they can get nuts, they can they can figure something yeah. out and get get them under the cap. Personally, yeah, and, I don't want Melo, but if they strike out on Hayward, I think he could be a Plan B option because if you they, if they didn't get Hayward, they wouldn't have to match salary, so they could just trade like Crowder and someone else right. and absorb his salary into the cap. Yeah, then you have him for a year or two, and then that's it. Like it's not like you're committing to the guy forever. Yeah, and since LeBron and him are friends, then he can come to Boston and all is done. Maybe it would all work out in the end. Yeah. <laughs> that will never happen. I, I mean, I'm not a big LeBron fan, but I mean, obviously he's a stud, so I'd take him any day of the week. I, I would not. I, I'm with you. I can't stand him. Yeah. You wouldn't I, take him on the Celtics. Come on. I wouldn't I, be able to root for him. I wouldn't be able. I don't think I would. I couldn't no. root for him. I know they'd no, be better. No. I know. I, I know he's the best player in the world, but I cannot stand him. Exactly. N- neither can I. But I mean, come on. I, mean, I just really just I despise just him on a whole nother level. Where I just if he came here, it wouldn't make rooting for the Celtics fun. No, it would, it would ruin it. It'd be like if, yeah. if like if Peyton Manning came on to the, like replace Tom Brady. But yeah, no, exactly. No thanks. Yeah, but you're replacing a, a goat. You can't replace Brady. You know. No, that's true. But, I mean, that's another conversation for another day. But uh, quickly, do you think LeBron? Is there any chance of him leaving Cleveland? Obviously not to Boston, but yeah. You know, oh yeah, like, I, think, I think Clippers, they're... Lakers. I think there's a great chance. I I, I don't know if it's a hundred percent chance, but I think next year he's probably going to sh- try to shake up the Cavs for one more year. He's he's their GM, so he's going to come up with some other uh, maybe he trades Kevin Love. He brings in Carmelo, or he does something. And they make it to the finals. They lose in four or five games to the Warriors. And then he loses his mind. And he's going to go to either the Clippers or the Lakers and play with Chris Paul and whoever else with the Clippers or Paul George and whoever else with the Lakers. But yeah, I, it would not shock me at all if he left. Yeah, that's the no. thing. I think he would leave Cleveland if the right scenario presented itself where he could actually win. For yeah, another that, super team. Yeah, as of now, there's not many. One thing that I just like completely made up is maybe this year or next year, if he decided to join up with the Spurs and Kawhi Leonard, and I think he could <laughs> <laughs> they do some damage there. 
That would be a that would definitely be a spot where he could win. No yeah. doubt. Yeah, and the uh one of the last questions we have for in terms of uh Twitter, that underscore guy underscore D Y L again, these crazy Twitter names. Huh. But you know, mine's simple, be strong four one five. I mean, you know, simple names like that. But uh, you know, what would be the perfect off season realistically, obviously, I mean perfect off season, we let's just go get Kevin Durant, but yeah, right. Um would look like for the Celtics, not just now, but in the present and the future, what would it be? I think honestly, and I know this is not original at all. Everybody has said this, but you just simply you draft Markel Fultz number one. You sign Gordon Hayward. You bring in the two European stashes that were first round picks last year, and you hope that one of them is pretty good. And Fultz and Brown develop this year. You have that pick next year that either ends up being in a nice trade piece, or you draft yet another guy, and you sort of have another you know season where you look to improve and you look to close that gap on the Cavaliers for the next couple of years. Yeah, I mean that's that's what it's all about is you know closing that gap. Whether it's they're not going to be able to do it this year, you can't put together a group realistically no. again unless you got like KD or something. But you're not going to put it together a group that's going to beat the Cavs or the Warriors. And honestly, no team's going to be able to put together for this year i mean right no i i, I don't know what's going to happen like the the calves need i don't know i don't think they can even do anything and you know the warriors are going to have to have like infighting or an injury like that's the the gap is pretty significant yeah it certainly i think this year's playoffs if nothing else opened Celtics fans' eyes, including myself, you know, just how significant this gap is. Oh, yeah. Um, unfortunately, it is what it is. But uh, I appreciate you uh, taking the time. Just Not wrapping up. Um, so, again, you can check out Keith, uh, Dale and Holly with Keith. That's right. Yeah, although, although he'll call it something else. Yep, um, that's but true. Find it 93.7 on the dial. And uh, check out his Dork podcast. That is what it's called, right? It's just called Dork. Yeah, Dork podcast or hashtag Dork. Call whatever you yeah. want. It's on awesome. there. We're on iTunes. Check us out. Yeah, and uh, you can subscribe to him. You can subscribe to us, All About 18. Check out us uh, at Celtics Direct and CelticsDirect.com. We got merchandise. I saw that you got some merchandise as well, Keith. Yes, hashtag dork shirt. So buy the shirts up. Let's go. Yeah, they got black and uh, red Red writing. They're pretty sharp. I saw yes. them. Thank you. So uh, check, out, check out everybody's uh, merchandise as well, and uh, we will talk to you next time.